Uh, welcome to this afternoon's workshop. Uh, for the next couple hours, we're going to be talking about a couple of uh, open source projects uh, that Google has, has started uh, that are related to building games. Uh, they're called Open Match and Agones. So you got Open Match and Agones. Uh, we've got, we got the shirts going on. And uh, yeah, hopefully you guys all have a great time and learn something new. We're all here to learn something new. Excellent. All right, so first we're gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Robert Bailey. Uh, I'm gonna kick off the workshop this afternoon. Um, after my section, I'm gonna hand it over to Mark, who's over here wearing the white shirt. Uh, everybody say hi to Mark. Uh, Mark is gonna talk about Agones for us, and then Mark's gonna hand it over to John, who's over here in another yellow shirt, uh, who's gonna lead you guys through Open Match. Uh, and then April over here, who you guys just all got your little sheets from, is our coordinator uh, and an open source program manager at Google. So if you guys have any questions or get stuck with anything, please reach out to any of us. We'll be wandering around the room when we're not presenting. Uh, and then I wanted to open it up and sort of see who's in the audience today. So is anybody here currently a game developer? Cool, we got a couple game developers. Are, do any of you guys build like multiplayer online games? Excellent, awesome. So this is gonna be sort of perfect. This is sort of right up the alley for what you guys want. Uh, how many people are here because you're at KubeCon and you thought this sounded interesting? Okay, most people. All right, so hopefully all of you guys learned something new. Hopefully maybe you go home, uh, you know, you maybe build some games on your own time, and this, this sort of helps give you guys a big kickstart to, to getting started doing that. All right, so what we're gonna do, uh, we've got a Google Doc that everybody's gonna open up and we're gonna walk through. It has a whole bunch of commands in it that we're gonna copy-paste into Google Cloud Gel as we get going. Uh, if you open up this bit.ly link, uh, it'll take you to the top of that doc. So I'm gonna leave it up here for just a minute for everyone to see. And then I'm gonna go ahead and open it here and we're gonna walk through it together to get started. All right, does anybody not have it open yet? Okay, I'll get my comments. This is the most important part. Everybody's gotta get the setup done. Uh, make, make sure we get that done right. Okay, did everybody find the doc? Awesome, so it should look something like this. Hopefully this is what you guys are seeing in your doc as well. Uh, so you guys all have a Google Cloud account. Uh, so if you go into your cloud, you should be able to log into your cloud account and go to the Google Cloud console. So if you go to cloud.google.com slash console, it will open up the Google Cloud console and prompt you to log in if you haven't already. Once you go to the console, if you look in the upper sort of right corner, uh, there's this little uh, command prompt here that's circled in red that you should go ahead and click on. That'll open the Cloud Shell. Uh, it's right here if you guys wanna see it on my screen up in the upper right, and it says activate Cloud Shell. Uh, we're gonna click that to open it up and we're gonna spend a lot of time in the Cloud Shell today, so you wanna, wanna get comfortable with that. Uh, and that's where we're gonna run all of our commands. Okay, once you guys get your Cloud Shell open, we're gonna first make sure that it's actually, oh, Mark, you wanna raise it? Yeah, hand. Right there in front of your green shirt. Uh, once you have your cloud shell open, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, make sure that you are authenticated. So G Cloud off list should print out uh, the account that you're currently active as. It should be the account that was on a little sheet that you were handed out. Uh, if you don't see an account there, uh, please ask for help. This is really important. Nothing's gonna work if you don't have an account listed there. Okay, assuming you see an account there, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to list our project. Uh, you should have a project that was provisioned for you automatically. Uh, you should see it at the top of, in your URL, and you should see the project name get printed out here. Uh, if you don't see the project name get printed out, the, there's the next command in the document to set your project, which is gcloud config set project, and then you type in the project name. Um, I've a couple of times seen that not get automatically set. Uh, generally with the test accounts, it works pretty well though, so you guys should see the, account, the project there. And the last thing we're gonna do uh, in terms of configuration is we're gonna set the zone. Uh, this is just setting a default so we don't have to type it every single time we wanna run a command. So you're gonna copy and paste this command which will set your default compute zone to the west coast of the United States. And it should tell you that it successfully updated your compute zone property. Now we're gonna, we're gonna do a couple steps here that take a little while, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started while I talk through them. 
The next one is activating APIs. So you go ahead and you paste this command in. What it's gonna do is anytime you wanna use a different part of the Google Cloud platform, you have to turn the API on for that part of the platform before you can start using it. If you try to start using it before you turn the API on, it'll give you an error telling you to turn on the API. The two APIs that we're gonna use today are the uh, Google Container API, which is for GKE, and the Container Registry API, which is for the Google Container Registry, or gcr.io, which is where we're gonna push up Docker images that we wanna run in our cluster. Oh, so that's still running. So this will take a minute. When it's done, it'll tell you that the operation finished successfully. And then to verify that that worked, we're just gonna try to list clusters. The list will be empty, but it won't give you an error telling you you need to activate the API. While we're waiting, is anyone stuck on any of the previous steps and need help? Everybody's activating their APIs? What do you say? The cloud shell is stuck on connecting? Is, is that, are a lot of people also having that problem? Okay, Did, was it just a restart or like reload the tab or just wait a little while? Okay. Um, if you could try reloading the Chrome tab and seeing if that helps, like relaunch the cloud shell. Is anybody having a different issue other than the cloud shell not connecting? Uh, so see on mine up here, it says project equals right there. Do you have a project ID in your URL bar? No. Okay, I'll send <coughs> Mark over in just a second. <coughs> All right, so after my APIs are activated, I can now try to list clusters, and it tells me that I don't have one. There's a nifty little button right here that if you click on it, it'll launch a, a graphical editor that we can use to edit files as we're working through the workshop. If you're comfortable using VI or Emacs or Nano, you're perfectly happy to do that in your existing shell. Um, or you can open this and you can edit files graphically, which is pretty convenient. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna create the cluster. This cluster is what we're gonna use to run the rest of the workshop. It takes about five minutes to provision, so as soon as you get to this step, go ahead and get it started, um, and we'll, we'll wait for all those to get created. <coughs> Excuse me. For the people that were having trouble with cloud shell connecting, is that Still failing? Is it working? <laughs> this is sort of the slowest and least exciting part of the workshop, by the way. <clears throat> Anybody else need help? If you need help, raise your hand. Mark's looking around to help someone. Everybody doing good? <clears throat>
or something. Come on, GG. What do you say? I never tested there. <coughs> It used to be faster. <laughs> yeah. I think it used to be faster because we didn't do executive job, make sure everything was working. There we go. All right. Once your cluster is created, we're also going to create a firewall. The firewall is going to allow us to connect to our game from outside of our cloud project. Firewall should create much faster than the cluster. And then finally, we're going to clone a GitHub repository. The GitHub repository has all the sample code that we're going to use for today. And we're going to CD into the directory where all the code lives. There it is. Excellent. All right, so I'm going to go through a couple more slides, uh, give people time to catch up. Uh, so if you're not all the way caught up, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a couple of high level concepts that we're going to do today. But first, we're going to do a demo. So what we're going to show is this is what we're going to end up with at the end of the workshop, uh, which is a fun game. Do you have another computer to play with? <laughs> so what we've got is a, a game. This is sort of a, a demo game that we wrote. Uh, for part of the workshop, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to find someone to play with, and we're going to wait very patiently while April tries to join our game. See if it times out before she joins. All right, and I'm a little spaceship, and I can fly around, and oh, and I ran into the sun. Bummer. I think it'll bring me back. There we go. Yeah. Oh, there's the sun again. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not very good at playing this game. That's, that's not a prerequisite for doing the workshop. Let's see. There we go. You got me. All right, so April managed to hit me, perfect. So anyway, that's what we're gonna end up with. We're all gonna get to play a game at the end. It's gonna be fun. Uh, so generally when you're, you're building a game, do you have a question? Is it a two-player game or can you like all play at the same time? It is a two-player game, and that'll, that'll actually be important. Uh, so generally when you're building a game, so in this case we're building a two-player game, you're gonna have two clients, and they're gonna wanna play a game together. And what happens is you have a matchmaker that finds these two people and says, great, you guys are gonna be paired up. We're gonna put you in a game together. Uh, then that matchmaker turns around and says, hey, like, these two people need to play a game. It finds a server manager, which is going to provision a dedicated backend for the people to connect to. The server manager is going to talk to some sort of infrastructure that is running these backends. It's going to pick one of the backends, uh, return it back to the two clients, and then they're going to connect, connect to a backend. Right? So this is sort of the general flow you'd expect. Um, now, wouldn't it be great if we were building a new game and we didn't have to rebuild all of this from scratch? Like, there are lots of pieces here that should be reusable across games. Uh, and two of those that we're gonna talk about today are a matchmaking framework called OpenMatch and a sort of server manager that's called Iconis. And what we end up with in architecture for the game that we just showed is the stuff at the bottom in pink are the frameworks that you get to reuse. These are open source frameworks. And the parts in the top are the parts that you have to build for your game. And if you, if you look closely, you'll notice that the parts in the top are really the game. That's what's left, is actually building your game. And in the previous thing, you had to build both the game and the infrastructure, and often these things are very tightly coupled. So in the example today, we're gonna have a front end, which is the thing that's actually serving the game. We have some custom matchmaking logic, which finds the two people and pairs them up. We have the dedicated game server, which is the back end that you actually connect to when you're playing the game. And we have a thing called a director, which is a little bit of glue that attaches these things together. Um, there's quite a bit of reusable code in directors, but oftentimes they'll be customized for the game as well. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mark, who's going to dive deeper into Agonis. Oh, 
and I guess just quick check, has everybody done provisioning their cluster, or creating their firewall, and so forth? All right. Yeah? Oh, wow. Apparently, my mic is a little louder. Fantastic. Cool. Um, so, Agonets, dedicated game servers on Kubernetes. Um, I'm one of the people that founded this project, so hopefully I know some stuff about it. It should be lovely. Uh, so we started working on this project about a year ago. Is it, who hasn't heard of Agones? Or who? Cool, they had, that's great. All right, you're gonna learn new stuff. Um, basically, we've, we saw the fact that there are particular orchestration models that existed for dedicated game servers, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that were in the wild and where there were a lot of proprietary solutions, but there wasn't an open source solution for it. Uh, so we got together with Ubisoft, uh, and we founded this project together with them. It's, actually, it's closer to two years now. Um, we recently hit 1.0, what, a couple of months ago. We were releasing 1.2 in a couple of weeks. Next month at some point, something like that. Um, and basically, it's a project that's built on top of Kubernetes for scaling and orchestrating dedicated game servers. So, what are dedicated game servers? Who here is familiar with the term dedicated game servers? Like the two people who put up, now some more people. Okay, cool. All right. So. Let's explain what that is just briefly so that people understand what they are and what they're used for. So traditionally, um, in a lot of cases, in your very fast-paced online multiplayer games, you'll use what's called a dedicated game servers. So something like a Fortnite or an Overwatch or a Rocket League, those types of games, what you have is you have an authoritative server that all your clients connect to running somewhere on the internet. And that authoritative server usually runs a full simulation of whatever's happening inside your game. Right, so where a player is moving to, what character is shooting something, what character is firing a rocket on their car. Um, they get passed in the inputs and the information necessary from the client, and it's up to that dedicated server to decide what's happening inside that game and pass that out to the rest of the world. We could spend another two hours talking about why dedicated servers are important. Um, as a very, very brief condensed version about why they work this way, they provide a few very important things. One, uh, it gives you control over latency. So if I'm playing a game, we're here in San Diego with a friend of mine in New York, that means I can put a dedicated game server right between us and we're gonna have a very similar gameplay experience. Right? I know from my game what my latency requirements are. For these very fast paced latency specific games, usually you want under about 50 milliseconds in latency. Um, and that means that I know, like I know, okay, these two players are gonna have a very similar experience because I can control geographically where it's gonna sit and I know my ping times are gonna be from that. The other side of the coin is that, I don't know if you've noticed this, who here plays video games? That's why you're here, excellent. Um, people are kind of horrible, and they cheat. Uh, so if you have a dedicated game server that is the authoritative game server of what it is that you're doing, that shuts down a large swath of cheating operations that are available to people, uh, that are available in other types of multiplayer scenarios. We're not gonna talk about today. That gives you a bit of an idea about what dedicated game servers do. Now, what's also very interesting about dedicated game servers, and one of the reasons why Agonis exists, is the dedicated game for servers, when you have nobody playing on them, they are essentially stateless, right? Nobody's playing a game on them, you can shut them down, no one's gonna care. When you have players playing on them, you have a full in-memory simulation. That means that we have state. So we move from a stateless state to a stateful state, depending on where they are in the life cycle of a game. That means you can't shut them down once you have players playing on them. They get mad, right? No one wants their gameplay interrupted, those things are really bad, people post on Reddit, it's awful, no one wants that. Um, so having very specific requirements around, here we go, is that better? Is that better? Now I'm not fading in and out. Um, having very specific requirements about when you can shut down game servers and when you can't is just basically an integral core of what Agonis does. So why do we do it on Kubernetes? Um, I mean, we're here at KubeCon, I mean, that's a good reason, but like, Kubernetes is kind of amazing. Like, who here has played with, like, CRDs and extensions? Yeah? They're just incredible. Um, and then it's really just a, a, a real, um, it's really amazing, like, what power they give you. And the fact that they exist meant that we could build this thing so much faster than we would have done previously. And obviously, there's the Kubernetes standard, right? This means that anywhere you can run a Kubernetes cluster, you can run a Gones, you can run OpenMatch. That's a really big thing. Whether you want to run it inside your studio, or you want to run it on your prem, or you want to run it on the cloud, wherever players happen to exist and players show up in weird places, um, you can run this infrastructure and, and make them help them out. Let's keep dropping that. Right up there. 
Okay, let's go back to the slides. I'm gonna shut that down. All right, so. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna install Agones. There's a few different ways we can install Agones. Um, we're just gonna do, we have a single install file to do that. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create a namespace called Agones system. So I've got somewhere to put my stuff. And then I'm going to do a kubectl apply with this install YAML. And this is going to install all kinds of things, including a whole bunch of custom resource definitions. So we wanna make sure that that is actually up and running. So let's just have a look at all the things that it's installed. So there's a few components in here. Have a look, they're all up and running, excellent. We can see there's a controller for our CRDs, and we have a whole operator pattern, and a few other bits and pieces in here too that we won't look at too closely. Uh, but we can see they're all running, so we have a pretty good idea that Agones is up and running. So, there we go. Uh, the next thing we're gonna do is build a dedicated game server. So the game we saw previously runs a dedicated game server. So let's get that started, because I know that also takes a little while. Um, we can discuss how that goes. Um, we're gonna put everything in the Google Cloud registry. We're just gonna export that to a variable. Um, if we wanna see that, we can do uh, See, that's gcr.io space agones, and we're gonna put containers in that registry, um, and we'll, we'll use that all the way through. Um, anytime you can't remember what the registry is, just type echo registry. Let's build this, and we'll talk a little bit about it in the background. Okay, that'll take a little minute to build. So that game we saw previously, right, the, the two ships floating around, uh, this has a very simple dedicated game server, right? It's not as complicated as say if you're playing Overwatch and you have a whole lot of physics simulation and all that kind of stuff going on, but it is tracking like where the ships are and it's sending information backwards and forwards. So it's doing all that work um, that, that is necessary to maintain that state within that dedicated game server. It's gonna take a minute or two. Um, I have a question in the front, shoot it. That's running somewhere on Google Cloud. Yeah, that's what Cloud, so the question was, where's Cloud Shell running? Yeah, Cloud Shell's handy. Um, another neat trick, actually, we didn't mention it before, uh, if you're in the middle of stuff, if you're finding a build, and actually, I should do it in a minute. Whee! Uh, if you go into terminal, now where is it? Where's boost mode? Uh, here we go. So you can see it here. Uh, I've got the editor open. You can also have it in other words. You can do a boost cloud shell. Um, I'm pretty sure it actually restarts it. It gives you 24 hours of a bit of a faster, faster shell, which can actually be a really nice, uh, a really nice speed up there. I think we forgot to do earlier. But this is kicking along. All the things. Actually, while that's going on, uh, I know what I can talk about. So uh, just for interest sake as well, so basically everything inside of Gone is, right, any dedicated game server you're running, it runs inside a container, right? So we can basically put in there whatever we like, whether you wanna run an Unreal dedicated game server, or you wanna do something similar to what we've done here where we've written one in Go. Uh, I know people who have written ones in Node, that's great. The only special thing that really we require although you can really kind of get around, with, around, around it if you need to, um, with the Gones is we do have an integration SDK. So we have an SDK that specifically gets embedded in your dedicated game server, so we can track things like, when is this game server ready? Uh, when is this ready to accept players? When is it able to shut down? Uh, when does it you know, wanna get configuration values? We, we give it a lot of power there. Um, this is because dedicated game servers as a whole generally can take 
30 seconds, a minute to load up. Usually there's a lot of assets they're pulling in. Um, so you'll see here inside this Go dedicated game server, I'll find the right line, here we go. Right. So we can see here when this game server starts up, yeah, it loads up a bunch of uh, configuration variables, and here we're creating our Goni's SDK. So we have, a, we have a Go SDK, we have a C++ SDK. It's actually gRPC based, if, if you're interested. Um, and here we're specifying, yep, we're ready, we're good to go. Um, we can also find in here as well, like later in our dedicated game server section, uh, shut down. Yeah, once, once we've had players that are connected to the game and they've exited again, right, it turns around and says, hey, I want you to shut down. That's good, you can get rid of that one too. There we go. Excellent, okay, so we've built our image. Um, I'm actually gonna enable boost mode now that I'm thinking about it. Boost Cloud Shell. Do it. That'll make things faster. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do with that integration SDK. Uh, you can do gRPC endpoints. If you wanna do uh, REST-based ones, there are those available too. Uh, we've actually seen a variety of patterns there with people doing that integration from that SDK. Like the rest one? Okay. As long as there is a thing that works for you, that is good. We have both the protos for gRPC if you have a platform that works with, or we have Swagger JSONs for the rest one as well. Was turning on boost mode a good idea? Ooh, connecting. Woo! All right, beautiful. Basically gone. Excellent idea. All right, so we built our image, fantastic. Let's push that up to GCR so that we have a dedicated game server that, oh. Again. Invalid reference format, that's a new one. Oh, don't tell me I have to rebuild it. Oh, come on. <laughs> Why, why do you hate me? Oh. Oh, I also know why, because Cloud Shell is not. Project. Gone is, there we go. Best laid plans. That looks better. Find out in a minute. It gave me a new image, I think it might not be. Hopefully it's faster because I went to boost mode. Best laid plans. So I'll let that run in the background just for convenience sake and I'll, I'll talk about a couple other things while that's going on. Um, so some of you aren't familiar with like custom resource definitions. Basically what that means is like people here have heard of deployments and services and that kind of stuff, that's all pretty normal. Um, once we install CRDs into our cluster, we can create these new nouns, right? We can create these new resource names that we can play with, um, which is really nice, which means now like there won't be any in there, but we can say things like kubectl get game servers. Now Kubernetes actually understands how game servers work. Um, that's kind of really impressive. Uh, this, this integration goes all the way deeply through, um, all the way through from the kubectl tooling, 
all the way through the Kubernetes API, all the way through to uh, generator clients if you're using the Go client so you can interact directly with the resources as well. Basically, it's, it's really impressive the kind of extension work you can do inside Kubernetes uh, to make this a reality. This is gonna rebuild again. It hates me. For interest sake, if you're interested in getting completion off your kubectl, that's a nice way of doing it very easily. I thought the Cloud Shell actually did it out of the box. Apparently not. Ah, here we go, beautiful. Okay, it is running much faster. It. But yeah, we even get code completion on like typing game servers, for example. There aren't any in there. Fine. There we go. Okay, let's try that again. Let's push that up. Okay, so that pushes our image up into our registry, so now we can actually do stuff with it. So what are we gonna do? So we're gonna create a single game server instance, right? You saw me see, do you need to kubectl, like get game server? Um, we're gonna actually do that as a, an individual one. So the first thing we're gonna do is create a file called gameserver.yaml. Back over to our Cloud Shell, go into space Aegon, file, we will call it gameserver.yaml, uh, and we'll copy paste in whole thing here. Read it. Yep, let's not do that. All right, let's copy that. Now what we will need to do in here is replace this registry value here. So uh, let's just echo that again so that I can see it. There we go. That. You get this wrong, bad things happen, so let's get it right. All right, so if we look at that there, there should be a game server.yellow. So now uh, we can load this just like any other Kubernetes resource. We can apply it. Let's do that and see what happens. What is the magic that happens? Okay, kubectl created, right? Game server, agonis.dev. That's all there. Uh, and so this has created a game server record, which is great. So we can actually get this record now. Excellent, so now we can see some cool things here, right? Like we talked a little bit about that um, SDK so we can see these game servers are ready. They're ready to accept connections. Uh, we can see it has a public address, right? There's an IP import. Dedicated game servers, traditionally, you make a direct connection to your dedicated game server. You're not using load balancers. You're not using anything like that because you want to have the clients connected directly to the machine that has the in-memory simulation state. Right? Very important. We also don't want the extra latency hop of load balancers either. That's less than ideal. Um, so we want to make direct connections. So we, we manage that for you inside of Gonos too. We, we do all that port allocation, we make sure we can find the right IP address, all that kind of stuff as well. Sorry? So all of this is just the IP address of the node. So it can be a v4, v6, whatever Kubernetes supports. Is that a question or does that need help? Question. That's a good question. So um, actually, we'll have a look. So here, when we run kubectl get pods, but uh, you'll see that there's a backing pod. It has the same name as the game server, and there are there are two containers there. 
So Agones does spin up with a sidecar container that has basically the logic for that SDK that we have embedded. Um, and that just runs alongside it. If you want to run your own sidecars too, totally fine. You can also do that as well. So yeah, that's, that's the pod that sits next to it and they sort of run, run in step with each other. Actually, in the notes. Reading's hard, I understand, 100%. Cool, all right, so we've seen that the game server is ready when we did kubectl get game server. It's ready, uh, so we can connect to it. So uh, we have a link in here to um, basically the same thing you were seeing previously with that, I think it doesn't have find a game, but we can connect to our game server directly. This is just a front end. You'll actually be uh, deploying this later. But this means that you can connect to the game server we had previously. So I'm just gonna copy this here, paste it in, and just put the colon in. So it's just me on my machine, but you can actually take your one and say, okay, what's happening? Am I connected to it? What's going on? If I drive myself into the sun. Cool. But you can test to see that your game server is up and running and that you can connect to it and actually play a game. Cool. So that's, that's running a game server. Um, but realistically, we don't want to be really spinning these up uh, on demand. We want to we want to have like a, a warm set of them up and running. So let's let's just delete. Let's delete the game server just as cleanup. There we go, so now we've cleaned that up. So we were talking just then, right? Like, so spinning up one game server at a time tends to not be an ideal scenario in like real production workloads. Game servers can be quite heavy with the amount of assets that they load and their load up time can be quite slow. We're talking like tens of seconds, minutes, um, depending on the game server and what it is you're doing. So realistically what we actually want is just to have this big group of them just sitting there waiting for players to come connect to them. and Then we can pull game servers out of that pool and assign them to people in, in a much faster manner. So Agonis has this thing called fleets, which is literally that, right? It's just big, big sets of, of game servers. Um, if you want to think about it as like pods to deployments and game servers to fleets, very similar. So here we have, uh, what we're going to create is a fleet.yaml. Let's do that. File, yaml. And we copy paste all this stuff in here as well. The same thing as before. We need to uh, copy in the registry, place that bit. So if we look here at um, our fleet, and actually let's shut this down. It's basically the same as our game server configuration, which I didn't actually dig into too much before. So let me look at that right now. Um, this section here, you'll notice, looks pretty much like what we had before. All right, we have our container, which is our game server container. Uh, we have some like CPU and memory requests, which is like just standard pod spec stuff, which is we can do all our normal pod spec stuff here. Uh, we have some port configuration, so we can make that direct con uh, configuration. That's all great too. Um, but realistically, for like for the fleet, really the only big difference here is that we're specifying how many replicas we want. Looks very much like a deployment, and, and somewhat similar in that way as well. So we're able to create fleets of game servers basically through uh, applying this. So let's apply it and see what we get. Sweet, so same as before, it creates that. And so this has created a fleet, which is gonna create two warm game servers sitting there. They're gonna become ready like we saw previously. Um, excellent, uh, so let's have a look at that fleet that we got. Cool, so we can see there, uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about scheduling, that's a whole thing. Um, but we can see here, right, 
We call the fleet dedicated. Just to confuse you, it's the same name as the game server, it's the same name as the fleet, that's just fine. Um, we've asked for two of them, we currently have two of them, and two of them are ready. They came up, they came up pretty quickly. We can also do exactly the same as what we did before. Let's just get those game servers, and we can see them in a list, right? So we can see that we have two of them. Um, they're both running there, actually they're both on the same node, which is also nice, just the way they should be. Um, and they're sitting there ready for us to do stuff with them. And we can treat this kind of similar to um, how we treat deployments, right? So we can scale them up and down. So if you're like, oh, we have more players now, like more than, I don't know, four, uh, <laughs> which would be nice. Let's just scale them up to, uh, to replicas five, so maybe we have like 10 people who want to play a game. And it's just as simple as doing it as you would do with a deployment. Now, we're not gonna talk about it today. There's a whole host of like auto-scaling capabilities um, as well within Agones. I'm not gonna get stuck into it today unless we have like time way at the end, um, which looking at the time we probably won't. Uh, but just know that that's there. So if we have a look here, we can now see we have now five ready game servers up and running, right? And so we can scale this up and down manually. We can do some other stuff as well. Um, but for this, this we're gonna scale it up and down just using the manual commands. Okay, so we have this warm set, awesome. But we're making direct connections to game servers. We're not using something called a load balancer, so we can't do like road ro round robin lo load balancing or anything like that. So how do we get players from like when we've match made them to a game server? How do we basically say like how do we get a game server? So we have this concept of what we call allocation. <coughs> Basically what we're doing here is we uh, create this thing called a game server allocation, uh, and what its job is is to atomically look through our pool of game servers that are warm, find the appropriate one according to some rules, and we won't blow it up, and hand it back to you once you want it. And the other very special thing that it'll do um, is it'll mark that game server as what we call allocated. So if you thought it was ready, it'll move into an allocated state. That allocated state is that very special thing that says, hey, this has players on it now, we can't touch it until they're done. Really important for gameplay, right? So here we're gonna uh, create ourselves a game server allocation. We're gonna do it in a YAML file. Usually if you have a direct integration through something like a matchmaker, you're probably gonna do it through the API directly, uh, but it's much easier for this demo that we're gonna do it through the YAML file. Uh, we'll see a little later, there's some stuff that we'll actually do it through the API when we do the open match section. So here we have this, this game server allocation. Uh, what do we call it? Myallocation.yaml, let's do that. That is a file. File, location, beautiful. We'll just copy this in. Now what this allocation here is doing is um, basically searching through that fleet that we created earlier. For interest's sake, You'll notice this is just a label selector. It doesn't actually have to be tied to a fleet, and we have a, a few sophisticated selection options that are available through an allocation as well uh, that we won't talk about too much today. Uh, but here we're just gonna go, yeah, this fleet that we set up called dedicated, let's just pull one out of that uh, and give it back to me and mark it as allocated. So we'll do this here. So you'll notice here this is a, actually a specific create operation rather than an apply, because we, want, we only ever want to create a game server allocation. We don't want to uh, ever update it. Uh, and I'm just gonna do dash O YAML at the end so that we get the results back as YAML. So when we run that, that's gonna go and look through our Kubernetes cluster, look for a game server, and we'll see down here, right, this status section. So we're basically getting the details of that game server that um, was allocated to us we can see the state is allocated, what its IP and port is at, uh, what its name is in case we need to get more information about it. Uh, it's all there and available to us. There are, so, there are other options here. If we just kept allocated, we'd probably get a, like an unallocated thing if we just ran out of game servers, which can happen. Um, it gives us some information there. But let's have a look at what happens when we do a kubectl get game servers. So we can see there, right, we have those five game servers, but one of them is allocated. This is a special one. This is the one that has players on it. This is what I like to call sacrosanct. It's like super holy. Um, you do not want to delete this. And one of the things that we're gonna, we're gonna have a look at this as well, but like we can do stuff to our fleet 
without having to worry about this allocated game server. We don't have to worry about interrupting gameplay because Agones is going to manage that for us. So we can do the same thing we did just previously as well. We can take the details of that allocated game server. We can connect to it, which we've already done, but you know, more games better. Paste that in. This is just a whole new game server. Beautiful. And that still works. Right? And we wouldn't expect anything different. The state change doesn't change the dedicated game server, but we can still connect to it. That's the one we got from our allocation. So let's test things now. All right, so we, uh, I just found a bug in our lab. Um, we made a small change. Um, if you connect to the dedicated game server and then exit, it assumes that the thing's shut down and shuts itself down. Uh, so you'll notice now we have one that none of that are allocated. So let's just reallocate one real quick. Let's just rerun that create. Had to be some bug somewhere. So. Now we have one allocated game server. That's better. So now we can do our next one. So let's scale things down to zero. All right, we have a player. We have a we have a set of players that are playing on a thing, but for whatever reason, like we don't we don't like this fleet anymore. We're like, no, nah, yuck. We don't like it anymore. Let's scale it down to zero. So what we should see here. Do a watch kubectl get gs. It might already. Yeah, it's already done it, so it doesn't even matter. Um, we can see that it all scaled down, but that one individual allocated game server, that doesn't go anywhere. Right? It's not gonna go anywhere until somebody actually plays the game and it says, hey, I'm done. I'm gonna shut myself down. Or like someone very specifically says, delete this game server. It has to be an explicit operation. Otherwise, it just assumes that like I got players here and like it's never gonna touch it. This also means we can do things like make updates to our fleets as well, and we'll have rolling updates roll through our fleets while we have people playing the game. And then we'll slowly get, as people shut down game servers, the new version roll the way through, but we're not gonna interrupt gameplay. This is not something we can do with deployments. This is not something we can do with state sets. Uh, this is only something that you can do with Agones or some kind of custom solution. So let's uh, clean that back up and we can move Actually, we're right on time, that's perfect. So let's delete that game server. Yes, is just shorthand for that one. We can do dedicated. And then we'll scale this back up. Dedicated replicas back to five. We'll move that back up to five so that we have five available so when we do our matchmaking in just a minute, we will be good to go. We have, see, actually, we have six minutes just before we move on to open match. Before we do that, do we have any questions about the Agone section? In the front. So the question is whether or not you want to have like game specific logic exposed as labels uh, so that you can use that through allocation. Yes, you can do that. That is definitely a way you can do it. And we have things in our SDK that enable you to push out labels from your game server externally. If need be, through the SDK, you can also self allocate a game server if you want. There are some workflows. We don't prefer that because we have much better, I think we have much better algorithms inside our system for packing things as tightly as possible. Um, so pros and cons. But yeah, if you want to use labels in very dynamic ways, you can totally do that. And we have some preferential stuff in there too if you want to prefer certain things and then fall back on others. So the question was whether it'll respect uh, configurations from like Istio. In what way would you configure Istio to work with game servers? So you can only, so if you want to map to an individual pod, because that's the only way you could do it, right? You got a direct connection. 
Um, it's a really interesting question. So I would say if you're gonna, like we're not gonna get in your way. So if you do an allocation and you're like, we give you back an IP and you're like, well actually I know this game server is gonna map to somewhere else, then you just point it elsewhere. Yeah, then that's, that's kind of on you. Uh, right now, it's, from what I understand of what Istio does, and like that's a small amount, um, I don't know how it would integrate with a game server, to be blunt. Um, I think Envoy only just got some work in progress UDP support, um, and I wanna actually talk to the Envoy maintainers about what it is that they do, because uh, game server proxies is uh, something I really wanna talk about, and I think that's really interesting. But we can have that whole thing offline. But yeah, no, that's a super interesting conversation. Anyone else who wants to talk? That are going in. No? All right. Wonderful. In which case, I will invite John up to the stage. Testing, testing. Hi everyone, I'm at the podium. Um, sorry if I seem a little jittery, I have caffeine and I only do that when I play games. So if I move around a lot, sorry. Uh, so um, now that we've gone through the open match section, now uh, we've, as we discussed earlier in the opening, that we have, we wanna make this multiplayer. So Aganas is responsible for creating those game servers for our players to connect to. But what are, what are, we, what are we gonna do to actually build out a way for our, game, our players to actually connect to these game servers? So, uh, as you can tell by the text on the screen, uh, Open Match is a large scale matchmaking framework. We use the word framework as opposed to a matchmaker uh, solely because we wanna provide you the tools to create your own matchmaker. So, getting on. So, first things first, uh, I'm assuming from the show of hands, a lot of people play multiplayer games in here. Uh, but for those of you who don't, who like to play your casual you know, one player games, uh, we're gonna define what matchmaking actually is. So uh, matchmaking enables players to actually be grouped together to play a game uh, together. Ideally, uh, they'll be you know, grouped together, whether it's gonna be by skill, location, region, and other factors that will like, uh, you know, uh, you know, pretty much separate players. For example, I'm a very big player of Overwatch. Uh, uh, a way that you would separate players is based on role queue, which is uh, whether you're gonna play tank, support, or DPS. So that's one of your extra parameters that you'll pass into your actual open match functionality to actually separate your players. And uh, your matchmaker is also responsible for you know, low balancing your players into specific regions so that you have lower ping. That way your games are a little bit more enjoyable. So uh, what we wanna do is provide those tools to actually build out those, uh, build out your matchmaker so that your, your players will actually want to play the game uh, so that there's no latency. So um, as I've said, uh, Open Match is an open source gaming matchmaking framework. Uh, it's meant to help you provide you the tools to actually, that are commonly found in matchmakers and you can customize them, swap them out for whatever you want to and it helps you build your matchmaker. So that's what we're gonna do in this actual lab today. Uh, we're actually gonna build out a matchmaker. So we're gonna talk about the traditional matchmaking architecture first. So. Uh, on your left, you'll see that you have a large group of players that wanna play. And then you'll see that with some type of functionality, some type of matchmaker, your players are assigned to some game server. Um, there are many pros and cons to this. Um, usually your pros will be you, you know, connect your players to game servers and your matchmaker is in charge of all of that information. But what if your matchmaker goes down? You have one matchmaker that's running for you, if it fails, then what happens is your players will end up trying to connect to some other matchmaker, some other region, some other, uh, I'm gonna say cluster in this particular instance, like uh, you wanna you know, connect to that and it's gonna be very hard for your players to do that when they have increased latency to just connect to your, your matchmaker. So enter open match. Uh, it's a built on Kubernetes a series of microservices that we're gonna build out um, you'll see that your clients or your players will connect to your game front end, which will be responsible for sending tickets to open match and allowing you to actually call each one of these microservices to actually give you the result that you want, which is getting connected to a particular game server for your game that matches your particular profile. So um, you'll see that within open match, we have several components, the front end, back end, 
and data access, uh, and you'll see the director, which is outside of OpenMatch, which is responsible for connecting you to your game servers. So for this particular workshop, we're gonna build out three of these uh, microservices. We're gonna build out the front end, which is responsible for connecting to your game front end and uh, generating these, these tickets for you to actually try to connect to your game. And your back end, which is responsible for then requesting a game server. And the last service that we're gonna build out is the director, which is responsible for connecting your players to game servers and returning that response back to your game client. Awesome, demo. All right, so, oh, DPI is kind of high. Sorry, everyone, I play uh, Tank and Overwatch, so I like a certain DPI when I move my mouse. <laughs> All right, so, um, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start off by actually installing uh, OpenMatch Core serv um, Open Match Core Framework. So uh, like in uh, Ghana's, we're going to just copy and paste. We're gonna do it through a YAML file. All while we wait for, oh, pretty quick. It was a lot slower when I did it at home. All right, so uh, that, what we just did is we installed all of the, the OpenMatch Core Framework and a default evaluator. Um, so the default evaluator, what it's in charge of doing is actually uh, decolliding a lot of your match proposals. So uh, if there's any problems with, for example, you find that you are able to join multiple matches, you wanna make sure that you only update one ticket, so your, your evaluator makes sure that only one ticket is uh, assigned for a game match, so you don't get assigned to multiple game servers. So, now we're gonna run our actual command to actually get our pods, just see. Oops, did not copy. There you go. And you will see that we have all of our pods running and we have our Redis slate, which is the last one that's probably creating. That's solely because uh, we wanna make sure that we have multiple things to fall back on. Just, there we go. Everything's up and running now. Awesome. So like I mentioned, we're gonna start off by building three, uh, we're gonna build three microservices and the first one's gonna be our front end. So our front end is responsible for actually receiving these tickets from our game front end. And what we're gonna do with those game tickets is we're going to, we're gonna do multiple things. By the, word, by the way, the word ticket, what I mean is just pretty much a request saying that I want to find a match. So uh, just, I'm gonna define a little bit of vocabulary. I'm gonna use a lot of terms quite often. So a uh, ticket is just, um, I wanna play a game and we're gonna pass it into OpenMatch, and OpenMatch is gonna to try to find us a game and then update our ticket for our game server that we're gonna to connect to. So, there's a bunch of text there. I will go over that as this is building. So right now we're gonna build uh, our front end. Uh, we actually have everything already pre-generated in a Docker file. I can show that to you if you like. Just move this down. Uh, Docker files are not important. <laughs> Let's see. So while that's building, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what the front end actually does more specifically. So um, what I mentioned that we want to uh, create these tickets. So uh, in the line of communication, the way that if you looked at an architecture or took a picture of the architecture, the front end is going to talk directly to OpenMatch's back end as well as the director. The director will update the ticket and to the front end, which is then sent back to our client, and we're going to connect to our back end because we're gonna generate match proposals based on uh, whether or not this player fits this particular match profile that you're looking for. And I, will, I don't wanna jump the gun and tell you who's gonna generate those match proposals. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we build out our services.
Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I won't get into how much of the ticketing works, but I will will explain how tickets are used for matchmaking, if that kind of answers your question. Yeah, gotcha. Well, while this is building, any Overwatch players in a crowd? My man. How do you feel about the new patch? <laughs> Doomfist. <laughs> so I used to be a Diva main, and as soon as uh, she, they nerfed her defense matrix, everybody switched over to Orisa. Now Orisa loses health, and, health, and the shield is weaker. I'm actually very excited that Sigma's shield is a lot weaker. Um, because he was super OP and the double shield was pretty bad. So my favorite part was just throwing up shield when uh, Faro was barraging. That's my, one of my favorite things to do. But Diva will make a comeback, everyone. Diva will make a comeback. So while this is going on, I actually probably will talk about a little bit like the. Oh, I did. Awesome. Oh, look, it's doing things. Uh, so we'll talk about the prop a little bit of problems in matchmaking. Um, what you'll see is that in matchmaking, for I'll give you, I'll use Overwatch as an example. Uh, now that they introduced world kills, they'll actually tell you how much time it takes for you to find a match. Um, that's mainly because of the role that you're selecting, but also based on your skill level. So uh, skill level is usually on a bell curve, uh, starting with the bottom, which are lower ranked players, all the way up to your mid-tier players, all the way to your, you know, your GMs and your top 500. So um, that's why you see such a pretty, like, uh, like a large, like large, large, large wait times, mainly because many of your player base are stuck in the middle. And for your more experienced players, it's very hard for them to find a match because like, they're you know, a dime a dozen, needle in a haystack, essentially. Um, and then also there are issues with queues, not queues, uh, ping. So you want to connect up like, enjoyable matches where your ping is very, very low as well. So you can imagine there are a lot of factors that go into matchmaking. So uh, it's still doing things. Um, so the part of, part of the thing we want to do with open matches, you know, low balance you, place you very, very close to where you want to be. Uh, that lowers your ping times and then connecting to enjoyable matches based on not only role, skill, but we want to be able to match your profile very, very quickly and find the information very quickly. That's also why we use uh, Redis right now, just for caching. It's just going to store your match profile and be able to pull that information very quickly. So uh, just using Overwatch as an example, uh, op uh, open match will try to solve like a lot of those queue issues by having faster, uh, not faster queue times, but we'll try to resolve a lot of matches very quickly as opposed to uh, throwing everybody into a large pool and just wait for them to connect to a server. Are we using this with Stadia? Uh, no, not right now. <laughs> yes, that's why, that's why I said no. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, strictly speaking, just on games, um, yeah, just on games, uh, the overall benefit of just, you know, saying I want to connect to a game and just throwing you into a game server, um, it's probably not enjoyable. Uh, give you a great example. Imagine getting thrown into a game with Ninja. 
like, and you just started out the game, you know? That's not enjoyable at all. Like, you, you know, being within the bottom 10. So you don't want to just throw, be thrown into any game server, you know? So to, in order to make it a, a little bit more enjoyable, we want to give you the power as developers to actually write how you want to connect to Ninja or write how you want to connect to me who's never played Fortnite and, you know, 1v1 me or whatever, you know? Uh, I will answer your question after because we're, we're, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now that um, we've actually deployed our, our uh, image, we're going to now, click P, we're now going to push that to GCR. Can you, remember, can you repeat the last part of that question? Yeah, you can answer that. All right, so now that we've actually pushed that to GCR, the next thing we're gonna do is we're actually going to create our front end at YAML, which is gonna be responsible for creating our deployment and as well as a service that will pretty much run all of our you know, gen ticket generation and passing it along to our uh, backend and our director. A ticket? So a ticket, uh, a ticket is pretty much saying that I want to play a game, it's gonna have your you say, for example, your IP address, you're going to, you know, whether, just for this particular example, we're gonna do a 1v1 match, so there's not much information in it, but imagine that you, you wanna create a ticket and it holds your role that you wanna play in Overwatch and as well as your location. Yeah, exactly, you'll, it'll hold your, pretty much all your, gener your player information, location, which server you're connected to. Uh, exactly. So. I'm going to use editor. All right, so I'll give people a few more minutes, a few more seconds just to copy over. And in the meantime, I will paste. Oops. Awesome, so the next thing we're doing is we're gonna apply our actual uh, front end at YAML, and that will pretty much create our service and uh, we'll be able to get an external IP address that'll show the actual, what is our, uh, the IP address that we're gonna be connecting to once we create our client. So. Oh, also really quickly. So you'll see right now that we're waiting for our, our external IP to populate. Uh, I will answer your question in the matchmaking function section. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, actually, let me run that one more time. You'll see that our 
external IP is populated as well as a port. So close out. And now I will get to answer your question because we're now in the matchmaking function section. Awesome. So um, one of the most powerful, most customizable parts of Open Match is being able to create your own match function how, and pretty much specifying how your players will connect to these game servers and how they will connect to one another. Uh, like I said, it's based on, you know, just to make an enjoyable experience based closest on your region, player scale, yada, yada, yada. So um, what we will do is uh, what the matchmaker function is responsible for doing. Um, it's probably very important to say. Um, what it's going to do is going to go over all of these tickets and essentially find a ticket that will f pretty much meet a match proposal. Uh, a match proposal is uh, created by the back end after it, uh, it's going to pretty much, let's see, the best way to describe it without overcomplicating things. Uh, match proposals is pretty much a specific type of match that you want to create, whether it's going to be like team deathmatch or say your free for all matches. It's going to create some type of match proposal with a bunch of uh, specifics that you want your match to have. And then your matchmaking function will query over all of those tickets and find players that match that that match what that match proposal is looking for. So when you generate your ticket, it also you're also going to specify what kind of match you're looking for. So when you meet uh, the requirements of your match proposal, then that's when you will get an assignment. An assignment is, I am assigned to this particular kind of match, and I'm going to connect to this particular game server that was created for this match proposal. Questions before I move on? Awesome. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create, because we're going to build out our matchmaker ourselves, we're going to create a folder called my, uh, my MMF, which is going to be my matchmaking function. And we are going to copy this first segment of code. I will go over what it does. Since we paste, I'm sorry. We're going to create a my MMF goal. Uh, that's going to be that's going to house our matchmaking logic. So, all right. So, I am a I'm not a Go expert by any means, but I will be able to you know specify exactly what's going to happen in this, this particular Go function. Uh, and it's going to be standard whether whatever language you're going to use to you know, write your matchmaking function. So what we're going to do here is we're going to actually, what this is responsible for is pre-generating all of our package and importing everything for us. Uh, you also see that it's going to import a couple of libraries that are responsible for a lot of the core matchmaking functionalities. And you'll see that here. And we're going to import a couple of libraries. Um, and we're just going to define a couple of constants. And what we're, what we're going to do here is we're going to create a gRPC client that's going to be responsible for listening uh, for all of these tickets. Uh, it's going to be pretty much passing all of this information along to whether it's going to be a direct or a front end and back to our, our client. We're going to be responsible for listening on a specific TCP port in order to get all these tickets. So that's what the first section is actually going to be responsible for. Next, we're going to copy this section, which is responsible for implementing our proto for our, our matchmaking function. Now, I'll give people a second. All right, and here is our last section. This section is probably going to answer your question as to, I just want to throw people into the server. I want to connect people together. That's what this section is responsible for. So um, we're going to run this run. This is our run functionality. It's going to pretty much run once we deploy our services. It's going to be able to listen to tickets. We're going to pass in along any information that we need to based on this my MMF struct that was you know created in our interface. And what we're going to do is I'm going to scroll down to this for loop right here. So um, I mentioned that the matchmaker, what it's going to do is it's going to run, it's going to loop over a series of tickets. And it's going to pretty much try to find you know, tickets that match together and meet a match proposal. So in this particular um, 
example, what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect just any two players that just come together on this particular server, particular port, and just match them together. So uh, if you want to throw people into game servers, this is ideally the way you would do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to find, this is pretty much our match proposal that we're going to generate. And it's going to say, I want to create a match ID at this particular time. It's going to have a profile name, which was specified up and before as one of our constants. And we're just going to name a match function. And we're going to go over all of our tickets. And you'll see that right here, all we're doing is taking the first ticket we find in our loop and the next ticket we find in our loop. And we're just pairing those two people together. So that's just ideally how we would throw in multiple people. So if you wanted to throw the first 12 players into a 6v6 um, match, then you would just you know, create another loop within this that loops over and finds the first 12 players and just throws them in together. And you can probably add some additional logic to put them on random teams if you like. So the power is all yours um, when creating your match function. So to, before a game server is actually created from our director, what we're gonna do is we have to satisfy a match proposal before that's created. I think that answers your question. So um, a game server won't be allocated until this match proposal has been met. And once the communication between open match and uh, the director, which is the liaison. Exactly. Perfect. I am not the expert in Ghana's, but I nailed that one. I nailed that one. All right. So um, once we match our players together, we're going to just say that we've created a match, and we're going to put these two people together, and we're going to update our match proposal. So we're going to send our response back towards um, the person that we're, the, the service that we're actually sending a response back to is actually our director, which is going to be responsible for allocating game server and then passing along and updating those tickets back toward our front end. So we're going to save this. Perfect, so, all right, the next step we're actually gonna do is we are going to create a Docker file. Um, since we created our match function, we need to actually build this out into a service that will, you know, as soon as uh, it loops over our tickets, we're gonna be able to find matches. So, And make sure that you're creating this file in your root directory for uh, space, space Aganas. So that way, any like uh, dependencies that you have within the Space Aganas folder can be found. So let's see. I'm going to give the correct spelling and name. And all this is going to do is just going to find our directory where our matchmaking function build it out of service. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to build out our image. I'm not sure if there's any more questions while this is building. Say that one more time. No. Yes, same one. No, no. I would just make sure that you uh, CD into your space bonus folder. Yeah. 
So the director is actually responsible for calling get function. Um, it's, there's a function in the director that will say uh, fetch matches. And what it does is that's what's going to, you know, implement that call to our service to actually, you know, loop over everything. So the director is responsible for talking to our, uh, our matchmaking functions in order to, to launch that service. Awesome. And then we're going to push this image to GCR. And next, we're going to make sure that we can create our deployment and our service. So we're going to create a my MMF YAML file. Second, looks like I might have had a copy. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so back to our MMF YAML. So we have to update our registry. So now that we've actually deployed our services for the matchmaking function, now we're going to get into our director. Now, director is responsible for fetching matches uh, from our MMF uh, service, and it's going to communicate with the game, the pretty much the dedicated game servers to actually assign people and update those assignments for uh, for matches. And once we get that response and our tickets are updated, then our front end will be able to pull these these tickets and match players together in a match. So. They could. So uh, the first thing that the first thing that it's going to do while well, I'm running this uh, building's image, 
the first thing it's going to do is going to be low balance, and it's going to separate you by regions. It's going to pretty much like depopulate a lot of your players. Uh, the next step after that is it's going to then pull over a lot of the players uh, if they're in a certain region. But what makes it very easy to you know pull specific players is the fact that we're using Redis, which is really important because you can grab that match information very quickly, and uh, and as well as a lot of the profiles. So you'll get a, you'll be able to pull over a bunch of players very very quickly and pull that information. Yes, so you can use you can well the great thing about open match is that a lot of these uh, a lot of these the the things that you use for uh, open match is going to be able to be swappable and customizable. So you can pretty much use uh, manage Redis such as like memory store or something. If you want to go to another cloud provider and use their you know Redis solution, you can also do that as well. Um, you can use pretty much any like, managed version of Kubernetes you want as well on any cloud provider. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give. Uh, a lot of our, a lot of developers, the tools to, you know, just have matchmaking functionality to build a matchmaker, but take it anywhere that you want to. Yes. So I originally, well, I work. My role is the same as Mark's. I'm a developer, cloud, uh, develop, cloud developer, advocate in games. Uh, originally, I was working on a lot of just personal solutions that I found missing in the gaming community, and part of that work led me to uh, interacting with Unity quite a bit. So. Uh, the founding of OpenMatch came from uh, the strategic alliance that we have with Unity, and that's one of the, the projects that's come out of it. So during the time when they were building out a lot of the core services, I became one of the advocates that would you know, enable developers to build their own matchmakers. So uh, my background will be contributor. I'll be probably focusing a lot more on the community side. I'll be going to a lot of conferences, a lot of meetups, and you know, helping developers get things going. I'll also be working on a lot of getting started guides as well. So we should be updating that. So if you want to follow me or follow Open Match, and uh, we'll be able to update you guys. Awesome. So now that our direct, we've built our image, we're going to push that to GCR, and I'm going to. Just because we're running short on time. All right. So uh, just to move things. A little bit faster. Uh, next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new file and we're going to call it director.yaml. Awesome. So make sure when you copy this, you do copy the triple slashes because we're going to be appending quite a bit of things onto the end of this. Um, I don't have that registry memorized by now, so. I should have. Awesome. All right. So I mentioned before that uh, the director is pretty much the intermediary between the game, the open match backend, as well as dedicated game servers. So in order to actually communicate with Aganas, which we're going to use as our orchestrator for finding games, creating game servers, and allocating them for players to play. We need to set uh, a bunch of permissions so that we can use the CRDs that that um, that OpenMatch ha that Aganis has created, such as fleets and game server allocations. So we need to make sure that we create the the, the, the required permissions in order to access that stuff, so that our game servers are created and we can we can establish that communication. So the first thing we're going to create is 
we're going to create a role. Um, if you're familiar with a lot of our um, our uh, service accounts and our security, uh, it usually works with giving someone a role, creating a service account, assigning that a service account to a role. So that we're going to do those exact steps in our YAML file. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a role, and we're going to call it Fleet Allocator. And the next step we're going to do is we're going to create that service account. So just following the same steps that you would in a normal uh, Google Cloud project, usually we have predefined roles for you. Here we're just creating a role ourselves, and then we're going to create the service account, which usually follows. And so wrap things up, we're going to then bind those two together. We're going to bind our role to our service account, so we're saying we're going to give this uh, this service account, this particular set of permissions as this role. And then we're going to, there we go. We're gonna apply this. Perfect. So now by this, by you know creating our third service, now we've actually implemented an open match, as well as implemented the communication layer that we need with our director to talk to open match, I mean talk to Aganas from open match. So now at this point, we should be able to, you know, ping our service and say, okay, we want to play a game now. So I'm going to now tell you guys to, uh, tell you all, excuse me. Um, we've deployed both of them, so now we're going to play the game. So what we're going to do is we're going to call get service, and this is going to help us get that IP address the external IP address that we need to actually connect to our game. So uh, right now, everything's deployed, and we're just going to play the game. So I invite you to find someone to pair up with them really quickly. And what you're going to do is you're going to take, one of you is going to take this external IP, IP address, and you're going to put in your URL. The other one's going to follow the same. And when you do this, your instance of uh, Space Agonis will come up, but we will have dedicated matchmaking for it. So instead of us actually having to, you know, specify the specific server that we're going to connect to, we should be able to just click Find Game. Once we click Find Game, There you go. So there are a ton of players playing this game. Maybe we have a open a gun is already. I mean, an open server already running. So uh, let's see. Let's open a new window. There we go. So uh, now that I opened up in two windows, you see that two players have connected and they're playing against each other. And I will play just for a little bit. I also am not good at this game, so. But awesome, now that we've, uh, you know, if, you, or if you're playing with someone right now, congratulations, you just created your first matchmaker. Uh, with uh, game server allocation and orchestration and allows you to play together. So yes, thank you. That will be the last step in our workshop. Let me go back to our slides. Awesome. So we're almost done. So just as a little recap, this is what our architecture for uh, the actual project looks like. We have two clients who want to connect to play one another. We're going to generate our ticket to our front end. It's going to communicate to open match and it's going to open match is going to call your matchmaking functionality. Well, sorry, the director will call your matchmaking functionality in order to generate uh, a match proposal for your tickets to connect to. Your tickets are generated by your clients using the front end and that will specify all of the requirements that you need for a specific match. And then your director, which is responsible for creating that match proposal will then launch your matchmaking logic, pull over all of those tickets, and actually find and satisfy the match proposal. Once the match proposal is set, 
uh, the director will communicate to Agonis, create a dedicated server for your two players to connect to, and then that information is passed back to the director, which then passes all of that information back to the front end, the open match front end, excuse me, and once all that information, your updated ticket, your server that you're gonna be connecting to is updated in the front end, it's passed along to your clients, and your clients will then be able to connect to your dedicated game server. And that's it. So uh, we're going to, uh, we, have a, we have 15 minutes to answer questions. Um, and otherwise, here are some helpful resources. You can find the Agonis project at agonis.dev. You can also find uh, OpenMatch at openmatch.dev. You can follow them on Twitter. And you can follow us on Twitter. We'll be posting regular updates. Usually, we sometimes participate in community meetings. And uh, we'll be pushing out a lot of content uh, surrounding these two projects. So. We'd like to thank you, and we encourage any any questions that you have. Uh, we don't tend to share decks because it gets complicated. <laughs> Is uh, the short answer? Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. <laughs> That's yeah, fine. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, if you want to have some fun, even like uh, find a per a person that you're sitting next to that has uh, their version deployed, and you can play against them as. Some friends now leaving at the back we're doing for the last 20 minutes and having lots of fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. But also happy to answer questions as well. Yes. So on that, like um, you're paying for what? It, like so for the open source stuff, you don't pay anything because it's open source. Um, you're paying for your GKA clusters depending on size. Mm -hmm. um, you're paying for your Redis instance depending on how big that is and how big your player pool is. So again, it depends on what your game is and its requirements. Uh, your Kubernetes clusters could run on like N1 standard twos, which like, we're talking GKE, like we're talking that. Like it could be two core because you have very light, or maybe you have very very like very heavy ones and you need like 32s or 64 cores machines. So it really depends on what it is you're doing and the kind of stuff you're doing. Um, so you're just going to have to pay for the underlying infrastructure. So we do have uh, on the Agonis side. So basically, how do you do like multi-cluster allocation? That sounds like a great thing. So we have we have some multi-cluster allocation open source stuff that's in alpha right now, um, and the docs are on the website. Um, so that is a thing. We are we are yes there and there is some really interesting stuff happening there. Um, yeah, it's. No, that's fine. It's uh, it's fun. It basically sets up an external REST endpoint and a gRPC endpoint that you can then ping uh, with uh, ability to set up communications between clusters uh, using SSL certs and stuff. It's a pain to set up because you have to do all the certs and stuff, um, but it all works because you can you can. It's 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 very common multi-cluster problems. Yeah. <laughs> So the big problem, if you federation uh, won't allow you to do things like, actually, what does federation even allow you to do? Um, so like, it won't allow you to do things like, how do I do an allocation across like all these things? Um, so you need to be able to do that kind of stuff. And so basically, the, the multi-cluster allocation API is basically exactly what you see in the allocation system that we see for, for Gunas, but like through a gRPC interface or a REST-based interface. Um, it also means that you don't have to deal with some of the intricacies of, um, doing security of accessing a Kubernetes API from outside of Kubernetes API, which is a whole thing. Um, and there's a lot of good reasons why it is the way it is, but it's also a bit of a pain in the butt. I'm also happy to talk about like extending Kubernetes. Cyril, go on, what do you got?
Well, funny thing is, you don't even. I think I know the answer to this. Yeah. I think, and yeah. I'd have to go double check, but for right now, I think we just say set up a, a secondary yeah. uh, open match somewhere else and just do a hot failover at a given right. point in time and just shift your players over if you know, something catastrophic happens. I'm fairly sure. <laughs> Get a bigger Redis instance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From memory, from conversations I had with the original, like we looked at like how much data and how many players you would actually need to like fill one of our Redis instances that can like store ridiculous amounts of data, and we we're like, it's fine. Uh -huh. I'm pretty sure there's also pluggable aspects if you wanted other storage backends from memory. Yeah, we from can... memory. Yeah. So if you wanted to plug in something other than Redis, you could also do that too. If you want to plug and play some stuff from memory. I think a lot of the info, everything that was stored in there was very short lived anyway. Yeah. So. Mm, that is a very good question. For long term storage. Uh, Well, we have really impressive logging, but that is a very question because we don't really, we've never thought about it in a long-term solution. So it's very, very like, I can't possibly think of a long-term solution. We've had conversations about doing like A-B testing with different match functions, yeah. and so then storing the, the state of what it is that you would have done otherwise, um, so you can do it against live data. I'm not sure how that works, because I'm not as familiar with open match as uh, some other people. Yeah. That's a good question. That is a very good question. I feel like there's an answer, but I'm just not sure what it is. Yeah. Sorry, the question was um, if you want to like intercept events within open match and like maybe like save the state data of what happened for long term storage or looking at event based data or something like that, how would you do it? Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what the answer is. Yeah. I'd have to go look it up. I think I feel like there, I f there might be a thing. I don't think it ties in. No, so open no. match doesn't do Kubernetes extensions. Yeah, it it's just it's just a native system. Ooh, actually, I just had a thought. Sorry. I know exactly how you can do that. The director itself is replaceable. So it's a standard API. So you could just write your own director that does whatever you need, and then you could just put that data wherever you want. Ah, yeah. I know stuff. Okay, so uh, one of the great things, uh, one of my favorite things about Agana is, is when it allocates servers and you're, you're actually playing your game, uh, it, any updates that happen toward the game will not affect any of your players. So it's kind of like rolling out patches, is what you're asking? He's talking about, you're talking about open match functions and how to switch out logic? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you want to switch to another version if you're your matchmaking process is taking too long. Yeah. So you saw that match function? Mm -hmm. It's just code. Yeah. So just write whatever you want. <laughs> so if you find your, if you set a timer at the beginning of your match function and you're like, oh, we've been here for 10 seconds, then like skip to another logic. It's an if statement. Yeah, but there's like literally, yeah, it's just code. Yeah. So you can write whatever logic you like in terms of like do this complicated thing over here asynchronously and just wait and then like oh wait it didn't finish in the time we want okay fine then let's move on to something else. Mm -hmm. It's all it's all just code so you can do whatever you like and you can pass in data through the match profile from memory. You match profile. Is it the profile that comes through and that's requesting that changes what what you're looking for? So I would no you can pass in your ticket. It pulls over tickets and it has a well, start time so Ticket is just your player. It's just a player information, but how long they're waiting in queue. Oh, probably, there you go. Yeah, for how long you're waiting in queue. So there'll be a start time for your, your match proposal, as well as um, a timestamp for when the ticket was generated. So when you just you know loop over and find, for example, how long your players have been in queue, you can probably fall back to some other matchmaking logic that will put you into a match a lot quicker, such as like a, I'm going to dump you on any game server at this point in time. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, that's what I love about open match as well. Like, we don't dictate to you how to do the match function, and we don't try and restrict you. It's just like it's just code. It's just a, a service, so you can do whatever you like in there. Yeah, we should probably build up some tooling for testing out queue times. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Uh oh, Cyril has more questions. That is a great 
good question. You should be able so to. So you should be able to because you can do both gRPC and HTTP endpoints. Yeah. So if you wanted to do something like that, I feel like you can do gRPC with Knative. I have something I wanted to play with, actually. I think that could be kind of cool. I've never messed with Knative, so <laughs> that'd be kind of fun. Oh, you want to see metrics? Yeah. So we do have tooling, but there are there are built into the service. There is a bunch of functions that you can just call to find how many players are actually connected. So it's fine. There, are, there are Prometheus and Grafana dashboards. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Say that one more time. Give me your mic. Yeah, there you go. I'll run over. <laughs> uh, you have elect directors and uh, this some kind of controllers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how we uh, elect the leader between these directors? How we operate be uh, between the several objects or resources? Uh, how to resolve conflicts between two directors? So how do we resolve conflicts with Kubernetes when it comes to? I'm not familiar with your uh, architecture, but you mentioned that you have director. Mm -hmm. uh, how it could be replicated, first question, and how to get consensus between these directors? Okay, but they operate on, on some uh, objects and they could. Uh, oh, you're talking about collisions? So I think the what you're actually referring to is the evaluator, right? That actually handles all of our collisions. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So uh, the evaluator's job is to ensure that uh, only one ticket gets assigned to a match at any given point in time. So you get you get deduplicate. So if you had like two matchmaking functions that acted on the same player sets or overlapping player sets, it's down to the evaluator to say, oh cool, these two have overlapped. So we're just going to dump one and take the other. Then when you come to the director and we're like, okay, we have this player group, right? We have this proposal. We want to get an assignment to leaving a game server. When it goes to what is, getting a game server back is an atomic operation. So directors are completely stateless. They don't need to worry about any other state other than I have this player. Cool, I have this set of players, right, that, that has already been deduped by the evaluator, and therefore I can just go get an assignment for them and pass it back. Yeah, and your evaluators, your evaluator and your matchmaking function are two customizable parts. Yeah. So for example, like you do all your matchmaking logic and you find that there's a collision, uh, you can customize your evaluator to just, if there are say three collisions, just pick the one that has the best ping, you know? Yeah, no, the directors aren't working on the same task. I think we're done? Yeah. I think we're, we're done. done. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, who still left. <laughs>